going to be a rather long video about doing literary analysis. And to show you how to do it, I'm going to use a sample poem from Emily Dickinson and discuss the elements of literary analysis and then discuss the Dickinson poem uh, as a sample <coughs> for each element. And that's going to take a while. So if you started this video expecting my usual short video, uh, you might want to just uh, come back when you have a little more time because I think this might take it 20 minutes or maybe more. Thematic literary analysis is about the theme of the work. And when we say uh, theme, when it comes to any work of literature, and by the way, that would include a play or a movie, uh, or of course a poem or a story or a novel, or even a song, um, anything that would be uh, literature, written words on, you know, whether or not accompanied like in music by a music, musical tune, you know, it's still, the words there are still literature. Um, so we're talking about any piece of literature, and when we talk about theme, we're talking about what is the point? What is the message? And a good piece of literature should have a message, and the message normally is related to some major issue of life, and the, the writer has some specific idea about that major issue. For example, they might be writing about um, marriage or falling in love, or they might be writing about death, or they might be writing about something like loyalty or fear or um, success, okay? So some major issue of life, and then they have a specific thought about it, you know, like uh, loyalty can be broken by money, you know, or uh, marriage isn't necessarily the best answer if you're in love. Maybe they have a thought like that. And uh, that specific message about that big issue is the theme, okay? And to get to it, what you want to do is look at all of the aspects of the work and find how the author builds out that theme. So normally when you read a piece, you can guess right away what the theme might be, but to do a thematic analysis, you go back through and you look at each piece and you make sure you're right. You make sure that you can find that the author is putting that theme into, into the piece throughout all of the aspects of the piece. Okay. Well, here's the sample poem I'm going to discuss by Emily Dickinson. And uh, it's, this is the whole poem. Dickinson's poems are usually short. Um, and her poems only have numbers, and they're usually referred to by the first line. So you'll hear this poem referred to as, I'm nobody, or I'm nobody, who are you? And you can just read it there. Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us. Don't tell, they'd banish us, you know. How dreary to be somebody, how public like a frog. To tell your name the live long June to an admiring bog. Now, if you just read this, let me just give you a moment to guess what the theme is, you know, and, and when I say make a guess, I want you to actually make a sentence uh, in, in your own mind or just write it down on a piece of scratch paper there. This is just your first guess, so don't get too tense about it. I think I would probably write down something like, fame isn't all it's cracked up to be, <laughs> or uh, not everybody wants to be famous, uh, or there's an advantage in not being famous. I think I would write down something like that. And uh, I'm using the word fame, but you're, you might have talked about ego or... Uh, self-image, you know, something along those lines. Okay, now after you have looked at your poem or your other piece of literature, we're using a poem for an example, uh, then you would think about all of the aspects of the poem and what aspects uh, you see there uh, that would relate to the theme. Aspects come in two major categories, fiction elements and poetic devices. And all of these you're going to be familiar with. Uh, they are taught like 
you know, back into elementary school in terms of uh, looking at stories and understanding them. So for example, you look at the character, the characterization uh, to see how the characters themselves relate to the main point or the theme. In this case, it seems like the main character of the poem is the speaker. And the speaker is saying, I'm nobody, and is proud of being nobody. And then there's also the character of everyone in the world who likes to be somebody. And the speaker is saying, to be somebody is dreary. It's like a frog. Um, so the main character uh, is prideful and prideful of not uh, being famous, which is interesting. The setting uh, might involve any aspect of the place, including things like the landscape, uh, what region it's in, um, what, is, what are the objects that are around there, uh, what is the story more or less likely to happen in this particular place, is it set in a historical time, you know, which would affect uh, everything about the poem or whatever the other piece of literature is. In this case, there really isn't much of a setting. The only mention of a setting is the bog um, in June. And a bog in June, I think if you picture that, it's going to be buggy uh, and maybe hot and muddy. And a bog in general is just not some place where people like to hang around. Um, but the bog is associated with being public, with being somebody. And our main speaker isn't in the bog. But the only setting you'd have would be the bog. Symbolism, here's how symbolism works. Anytime you see something mentioned more than once, it's probably a symbol. Uh, or if there's anything else that emphasizes it, it's probably a symbol. What you do is you compare that symbol uh, in the story to the way the symbol usually acts in the real world. For example, if you had a pen and this pen was mentioned several times in the story. And then towards the end of the story, the pen stabbed someone. You know, someone picked up the pen and stabbed uh, another person with it. Um, and maybe earlier in the story, someone wrote a letter with the pen that was very damaging and um, caused someone to lose their job or something. Well, then you would know that that pen was not just a pen in the story. It's a symbol of evil or it's a symbol of harm. That's how symbolism works. Now here, the only thing repeated twice is nobody. It's obviously very important. To be nobody is very important. And there's nothing else uh, really repeated, uh, no other major words uh, repeated, except maybe you, 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 you. So you and I are nobody. Um, and nobody is certainly a symbol for um, being a private person uh, or being a... Uh, a person who does not need praise from others, maybe self-assured. Um, now, another thing that's going on in the poem is capitalization, which um, Dickinson is famous for. So frog and bog and somebody uh, also are important. Um, and you might even think that they're symbols, especially frog and bog. Um, and and here they aren't repeated, but the poem is very short. They are capitalized, so they're called attention to. And they would be symbolic of uh, being somebody and being somebody not necessarily being a pleasant thing. A few more fiction elements. Point of view. Who's telling the story? Um, first or second or third person or someone who's acting or someone who is just watching. Um, and does that shift? In this case, there's no shift. It's first person voice talking about herself and her friend who she's talking to, you, um, and talking about then others. Um, so it's first person, uh, and I'm, I'm not really sure that, uh, that that's related to the thesis, except to say that the thesis is about personal point of view, and so the poem is in first person. So it seems like an obvious choice. Uh, tone, specific words. Now tone you can get a lot out of, um, especially if there's any connotation or denotation. 
where a word is particularly positive or negative, um, if there's any repetition, if there's any dialect. Uh, undertone, I think I would mention fog and bog and dreary and public. Um, because those are all kind of uh, negative words, or at least in this poem, they're negative. And they're associated with somebody. Um, and so that's, that's probably important for tone. To be somebody is a negative thing. You can tell by the tones of those words. Um, structure is about pieces and parts. For example, if the story or the poem is broken into pieces, um, and this, or the play, if it's in acts or um, uh, scenes, you know, most pieces of the literature are broken into pieces, novels are broken into chapters, etc. Um, in the case of a poem, you can easily see this uh, in the stanzas of the poem. And then the question is, how do those pieces compare? Um, and we, we, I've already said this a little bit. Here, the first part of the poem is, is kind of excited. There's a pair of us, exclama exclamation point. Don't tell, exclamation point. They'd banish us, you know. That's I'm nobody. Um, there's some excitement there. There's enthusiasm. Um, now, there are also exclamation points in the second paragraph, but not as many, or in the second stanza, excuse me, but not as many. Um, and, of course, the tone is quite different with the jury and the public and the frog and the bug. So the first paragraph has some excitement to it, and that's when the author is talking about herself and her friend. And the second part, maybe a little bit more um, down, uh, talking about the somebodies. And then plot more applies to a story or a novel or a play, but it's about um, what are the driving forces, um, how are the characters motivated to do things, and then the fact that they have those motivations pushes the story forward. Uh, and, and you know, what, what is in fact is driving the story? And usually that has to do with needs or wants of the characters. Our poem doesn't have much in the way of plot. Uh, it seems to just be an isolated moment of conversation between the writer and her friend. Um, so this is an interesting thing that we've seen here where point of view, maybe there isn't too much to say about it. Plot, maybe there isn't too much to say about it. That's okay. Not all of the fiction elements or the poetic devices will apply or be visible in every piece of literature, and they don't have to be. Um, but we should see most of them. And I would encourage you to make a list of what you do see and some notes. And you'll see in my sample, um, sample pre-writing, you'll see those kinds of lists and notes. Okay. Next we can talk about the poetic devices and Again, not all of them may apply or seem important to any particular piece of literature, uh, but we should just go through them. Um, rhythm and meter is something that's obvious for poetry. Where are the syllables? Where are the emphasis uh, points? Um, and these are actually, I've listed for you here some of the um, you know, main types, although a poet would give you many, many more types, you know, but these are some of the more, more like common. Um, and the th reason this is interesting is if there is a certain pattern and that pattern ends up emphasizing certain words uh, because that's where the emphasis falls or that's where the pattern of the syllabus or the, the syllables fall, then those words are probably especially important to the poem. So you want to locate the rhythm so that you can find words that the writer is emphasizing. Dickinson doesn't really uh, use that kind of meter or rhythm. And by the way, she doesn't use much a rhyme either and um, and sometimes when she uses rhyme there it's kind of off it's it's not a true rhyme um, these are things that when Dickinson was alive um, publishers noted and thought that she was a second-rate poet of course they were idiots she's a first-rate poet she just didn't seem to um, make an emphasis on uh, rhythm <laughs> so in this case uh, w wouldn't be too much to say about rhythm uh, but you should know them. Uh, in other poems that you look at, um, there might be quite a, an, an interest in the rhythm. Um, now, sound patterns uh, you will see in almost every poem, including Dickinson, and you're probably familiar with things like rhyme and alliteration. Alliteration when the first words, the first sounds of several words in a row are the same. 
But also you can have assonance, where words have similar vowel sounds, several words in a row are consonants, where words have similar consonant sounds, several words in a row. Um, and those are all sound patterns. And when there are several words in a row with these similar sounds, or with rhyme, a couple of words at the end of two lines that go together because they rhyme, then the author is calling attention to those words. And you should pull those words out and, you know, just look at just those to see what the meaning is and how it relates to the theme. Onomatopoeia is another sound uh, device that poets use. Those are words that sound like what they are, like bang or pop or clip clop, stuff like that. Uh, Dickinson doesn't use uh, much in the way of sound patterns, uh, but she has a little bit. Um, for example, frog and bog rhyme, and when you put those two together, the frog lives in the bog, you know, they emphasize each other, they bring it out. Again, they're negative words. I don't think you'd want to be a frog in a bog. And she's comparing the frog in the bog to being somebody. Um, and she does have two us's up above, but they don't really rhyme because they're not at the end of the line. Um, sometimes she uses a uh, not quite true um, rhyming like who are you are you nobody too you too um it's they're not exact rhymes but they're close uh and so here she's emphasizing i think with the you and the two uh her closeness to her friend and their similarity so again when you see these words with these sound patterns pull out just those words like frog and bog put them uh, together or isolate them if they're assonants or consonants or alliteration so that you can, because those words are being emphasized, and you should be able to connect them uh, to the theme. I keep going the wrong way in my PowerPoint, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but just stick with me here. Um, a few more poetic devices. Um, figures of speech, which you've probably heard about. Uh, they're not quite comparisons, um, although you might also get comparison in a poem. Uh, because they don't make a direct um, connection. It's more implied, okay? So this is where you get a simile, uh, like or as, or a metaphor, which is a simile without like or as. Um, and these are figures of speech because they, uh, they give this comparison uh, in this more um, open way, wind like an angel's breath. Well, they don't mean it's literally like an angel's breath. It's just a way of getting you to think, oh, it's a nice, gentle sweet smelling breeze maybe. Um, same with like evening of life. It's not a direct comparison. There's no evening of life, right? But you, we understand what this means. It's old age. Um, a few more. Uh, you can substitute the name of something for another thing to which it has a relationship. Like I am reading Joyce. Well, you're not reading Joyce. You're reading a book by James Joyce. And using part of something to refer to the whole, this rhyme to refer to the whole poem. Um, and you know, I'm not pronouncing these words because I'm not positive I'm gonna pronounce them correctly, but something like meta metonymy, metonymy, synecdoche. Cine I've heard that one pronounced and I'm pretty sure it's synecdoche. Um, so uh, those are a little more obscure, but I have had students really find uh, examples of those in poems and, and have some fun writing about them. Um, the apostrophe, if you know the word apostrophe for uh, an apostrophe in a, in a word to indicate possession or a contraction, but um, in poetry, apostrophe is where you directly address somebody or something that isn't there. Um, sometimes that also contains personification, as in death, where is thy sting? But death isn't there, but the writer's just talking as though death is there, calls attention to death. That's apostrophe. Anytime you'd refer to something or or like speak to something or someone who's not there, that's apostrophe. And then a few more you probably have heard of. Uh, personification, applying human traits to non-human things, uh, very popular in poetry. Um, imagery, using the five senses. Um, and then capitalization is often used by poets to call attention to things. Normal capitalization of the poem is just the beginning of each line. So if you see anything other than that, the capitalization is intended to call attention. Um, and then shape. Sometimes you get poems where the words actually create a shape on the page. You've probably seen this, like they create a heart um, or, or some other shape. Um, 
now we'll go back and look at the poem again uh, and think about uh, the literary devices um, Uh, the, f the figures of speech, okay, simile, metaphor, metonymy, synecdoche, and apostrophe. We don't have much uh, from Dickinson uh, on that, um, but um, maybe it's a metaphor, the bog, um, to tell your name the live long June. Your name uh, might be an apostrophe because you wouldn't just tell your name, you'd talk about how wonderful you are, right? Um, but she's saying your name is in to just brag about yourself. Um, she probably is using um, metonymy because she's talking to somebody not just not there. Or no, I'm, I apologize. Uh, that's apostrophe. Uh, talking to somebody not directly there um, when she's talking to her friend here um, and your name I said that wrong earlier uh, would actually be uh, cynic dosh I think I said the wrong thing earlier but uh, anyway you can see that she's using a few of those um, and then personification and imagery um, I think any imagery is any time when you'd be using the five uh, senses. Not sure we have much here, although we could imagine that the bog would be smelly, maybe. <laughs> um, she's not really doing uh, personification uh, either, um, unless maybe she's sort of personifying the frog, um, telling your name, croaking out your name, and talking about how wonderful you are. Uh, being similar to a frog. Maybe that's a little bit personalizing the frog, or maybe it's more like frogerizing the person, actually. But it's an interesting use. Um, she doesn't make shape poems. I don't think she has a single one. I, uh, I have the full volume of her stuff, um, and she doesn't do that. But um, Dickinson is famous, uh, as I mentioned earlier, for her unusual capitalization, and she definitely uses capitalization to call attention to certain words, like here, nobody somebody and frog and bog you couldn't count june because it should be capitalized anyway um you know because all the months are capitalized so uh, but definitely nobody somebody frog and bog are right on point of the theme of this poem um and so you know that should make it into your notes regarding the poem okay now after you get to the end and i have the poem here again at the end of this powerpoint just so i can refer to it, um, you can see that we found a lot of evidence um, by going through the fiction elements and going through the poetic devices, we found a lot of evidence of how Dickinson put her theme into the poem in all of these various details. She didn't use every single fiction element or every poetic device, but she used more than half uh, of both to get her idea into her words. Actually get it in there and that's how authors do it the de every detail in a poem or a story is important it means something and there shouldn't be anything that's just thrown in there without consideration because really then they could throw the reader off and give them something that didn't go with the theme so writers are very careful that all of their details every sentence every specific uh, fact or word choice goes with the theme and you should be able to when you do this analysis see that and that's what we just did with I'm nobody so thank you very much and I hope that helped uh, when you're reading uh, any kind of literature you can do the same sort of analysis